Howdy folks, Justin here. Uh, today, as promised, I am going to talk about the version of the Battle Mage deck that I uh, really enjoy. I feel like it's uh, where I want it to be right now. And I want to share it with you guys so you can uh, give it a shot. One of the things that I noticed um, when I was trying to figure out how to play this archetype was that I, if I couldn't seal the deal by turn 6 or 7... Um, I was having problems getting back on the board, right? Because I would drop one creature, they'd have one answer, and so on and so forth. So I increased the number of charge options by adding Nord Firebrand. Um, along with the multiple equipment in the deck, this provides quite a bit of opportunity for reach. Um, early versions of the deck, going along with the uh, theme of reach, weren't running Lightning Bolt, which was a mistake. I was playing around with this fella, <laughs> the Balmora Spymaster, which, as fun as it is, and I actually think it's it's not, I think it's got a place in a deck like this, but I just wasn't able to use it effectively, and um, I found that I was more interested in just going face than establishing value uh, creatures like this to slap equipment on. Um, you know, that's not to say it didn't win me games, but it wasn't winning games that, in the way that I wanted the deck to win them. Uh, so we threw Lightning Bolt in, and alongside Lightning Bolt, a similar card, I feel, is Greystone Ravager. Another Prophecy card uh, helps in the matchups where my opponent's also trying to race. You know, to, to get a four-power creature off of a Prophecy is huge. Um, and all of the, the early drop creatures are weak to cards like Murkwater Witch. And so it, it felt kind of like... And that was the reason I wasn't running it, right? Like, oh, if this guy gets killed, but um, my opponent's going to get a two-for-one with a Witch... But I kind of just felt that uh, capitalizing on those games where my opponent doesn't have perfect answers was a more consistent strategy to win than trying to build a more resilient deck. Um, I turned the deck into much more of a glass cannon than it was. But I think it works. Um, as far as equipment cards go, we have Crown Quartermaster, high value card. Um, super flexible, great one drop. I, I actually think it's more powerful than Fiery Imp. Fiery Imp can get in a lot more damage quicker. Um, although not that much quicker, but Crown Quartermaster trades better, and it also, uh, you, you know, by putting that Steel Dagger in your hand, gives you the ability to throw it on a haste creature later on, or something like that. Uh, Fire Imp, just a really solid um, one-drop card. As far as the amount of damage you can get out of one-drop, this is one of the highest ones you can find. I really enjoy, uh, t you know, having, uh, an ideal starting turn is one, right, where you have the Magic of Potion and you drop a Fire Imp and something else. Um, Dumber Nightblade, really high value again. The Steel Sword synergizes nicely with the Nord Firebrand tokens, the Battle Rage Orc. You know, and we have three different sources of Nord Firebrand tokens, it's worth pointing out. We have the Nord Firebrand itself, we have the Raiding Party, and we have the Markarth Bannerman, who left unchecked will just generate incredible amounts of value. One of the few cards in this deck that does that. Uh, to go along with that, then, we're running two copies of Northwind Outpost. This is a really all-in card, but we're running enough haste creatures and uh, source cards that I feel like synergize well with it that I think it's worth it. You know, to be able to have a uh, way to strike at your opponent after they've cleared the board um, with some firebrands, uh, some possibly some equipment, along with that Northwind Outpost bonus is just huge, provides that extra reach we're looking for. And Relentless Raider is uh, a card that I crafted to build the the uh, Wistmother combo deck. You may have seen it on my list of decks when I uh, queue up for games. Um, I have had, you know, fair to middle in success with that style of deck, but uh, I'm still working on the combo, but it's just not, not there for me yet. But uh, because I had them, I tried it out in this deck, and I, I love it. You know, it, it feels a little bad to craft a legendary one drop two one. Um, you know, I had the same problem when I crafted Ungolum. So to make three of these guys, I understand, is a bit of a tall order for some people, maybe playing on a budget. But this guy can get some pretty tremendous amounts of value. Um, not the ideal turn one one drop, um, but just a really solid card. Uh, you know, it forces you to do a little bit of math warrior business when you're calculating how to best break runes and stuff like that. But it, uh, I wouldn't swap it out for any other one drop. I really enjoy this card. Steel Scimitar, going along with the equipment theme from Crown Quartermaster and Dumber Nightblade, it's just a really solid card. It does require you to have Creature on the board, but, you know, the ability to combine it with these Nord Firebrand tokens 
is super solid, provides some extra reach, and a really great play to keep in mind is if you slap this on a Mage Slayer, the only answer your opponent's going to have are finish off type effects or creature removal um, or a uh, piercing javelin I finally remember that card name but if you place it on a withered hand cultist um, you know if you have the magic elixir in turn three you drop the cultist and then you drop a uh, steel scimitar on it against mage they are going to be very hard pressed to find a way to remove that creature before you can kill them um, making their piercing javelins which is uh, you know how they're going to end up removing stuff like the mage slayer uh, cost two more is absolutely huge earthbone spinner basically has one purpose and that's to remove guard creatures i tried out the six three let me show you real quick that removes guards um, or at least i thought about it but uh... it's just I feel like three toughness obviously weak to um, obviously weak to crushing blow and um, earthbone spinner. I feel like there's a little more utility in that in the event that you need to also silence a drain creature. The moonlight werebat is very popular right now, and earthbone spinner's ability to deal with that in addition to guard creatures I feel like is super clutch, even if it's a much weaker body. Sentinel Battle Mace obviously combos well with all our tokens. Um, Triumphant Yarl, we're only running two because, uh, you know, a lot of the games are going to be determined before you even hit one. Uh, having two in any hand is not where you want to be at all. So just to minimize that chance, we're running two. Um, Battle Rage Orc, pretty average creature. Again, more reach, more charge. Don't forget to combine Orc Clan Captain with your Nord Firebrands, um, along with the Northwind Outpost, or just two Orc Clan Captains. Getting those guys up to three power for charge for zero Magicka is really solid. Definitely something you want to uh, position correctly. So in the turns preceding a turn where you drop Nord Firebrands, make sure you have room in your lanes to do this. And don't forget, too, that if you're going to seal out the game, you can you know throw them into a full lane and then get rid of the creature after it's swung. Just make sure you don't get rid of the Captain. Uh, beyond that, the deck is pretty straightforward. You just go face. Um, but I feel like this is the most streamlined I was able to make this deck. It has been very consistent. Um, it's weakest against uh, Scout, I feel like, is a pretty bad matchup with all their guard creatures. And um, the Prophecy Assassin decks um, can get pretty lucky with their uh, Prophecies. That's the nature of the deck. So that deck can be kind of hard. It's uh, really solid against uh, tokens, it's really solid against all the mage varieties, and I've had a lot of success with it against the Crusader decks too, the more aggressive versions, we think we're faster than those, and against the uh, Control Crusader as well. Um, yeah, that is the list. We're going to record a game or two um, so I can show you the Battle Facts of Life deck in action. That reference might be a little old for uh, for some of you. The uh, it was a TV show a long time ago. One of the women on the show who played a younger uh, young girl on the show was on Survivor a few seasons ago. But I uh, I, th I think this is a welcome change of pace um, in a you know in a game that right now feels really dominated by prophecy cards and by mid range and control. This is a not necessarily a durable choice, but a surprise choice that I think can really um, both provide balance to the meta in terms of keeping your opponent keeping opponents decks honest and keeping them from being too greedy I think it's important that a deck like this exists and also it's just a lot of fun to play if you only have a couple minutes to play a game as opposed to the 10 15 minutes it might take for a control mirror or a scout mirror or something like that this provides uh, a, a welcome change in my opinion to that sort of uh, meta and I have to say I wasn't really a huge fan of aggro um, in general in these sorts of card games in magic or in hearthstone um, but I've grown to really enjoy playing this deck um, yeah, and if you have any suggestions for cards that you've, you've personally found uh, to work really well in it, I'd love to hear them. Uh, this is, I'm pretty comfortable with where this deck is right now, but there's always room for improvement. So, Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoy playing the deck, um, and I hope that you uh, watch a couple games with it in action so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. There's one more thing I wanted to mention. Brutal Ashlander is noticeably absent from this list. 
it's not that I think Brutal Ashlander is bad. It's just that it, it was the last card I cut from the list. Um, but the, the reason I'm not running it is because... Uh, first of all, I guess there's two reasons. Consistency. The last gasp, while powerful and three damage to anything, is not a bad thing. Um, I like to have more control over what my cards are doing. And in, in this deck's situation, it's not like we're going to win or lose based on whether or not we swing our Ashlander into a one-toughness creature and kill a creature in the other lane that our opponent has. Um, we actually kind of want the Ashlander damage to go face. Um, but I just found that I was getting more value consistently out of the other one-drops I was running. Relentless Raider uh, can do some nutty things, especially if you have two of them on the board. Fiery Imp... Um, you know, one swing at the face is going to get you almost as much damage as a good Ashlander hit. And uh, it's also a red creature, it's worth pointing out, for North of an Outpost. And Crown Quartermaster, the flexibility I, I mentioned that the Steel Dagger gives you is just so invaluable to me that I think Brutal Ashlander's omission is a, a fairly reasonable choice. Some tech choices you might make. If you're finding yourself playing a lot of aggro mirrors, Firebolt's not a bad option to run. It does also remove the 1-2 Guard Prophecy Fighter's Guild Recruit that uh, every green deck on the planet is running. But, uh, you know, a, an opponent's deck that has a consistent number of guards in the beginning is going to be a tough matchup for you anyway. So, a card that does no face damage... Um, when your opponent and removes a small guard when your opponent is just going to lay down a larger guard or a drain creature the subsequent turns isn't really what we want to be doing so that's it I hope you enjoy it um, we will be playing some games here in a minute and I will see you then have a good one